-hmm. Welcome to everybody who is currently signed on. We're going to wait just a minute or two to um, let more people join in, and then we'll get started. For those who have joined, um, just a note, by default, all attendees are on mute and your cameras are disabled. Um, if you have a question, we do have a Q&A section that we'll talk about. We are um, recording this and closed captioning has been enabled. So this will be posted on our website tomorrow, um, hopefully, or the next day, um, as soon as we can get it up. We will start in just a minute. Okay, good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Alicia Tutt and I am the um, Housing and Grant Specialist for this city. Um, a couple of quick items of note, um, you are at the um, Nonprofit Grant Opportunities Application Technical Assistance and Public Meeting Webinar. Um, we are recording this uh, webinar and um, it will be posted on our website 
probably tomorrow or the next day um, as an archived copy. And we will also post copies of the PowerPoints um, for you to view at a later date. Um, by default, all attendees are on mute and your camera is disabled. You do have the ability to raise your hand and unmute, at, and we will unmute you at the end for um, live questions and answers. If you have questions during the presentation, um, or if you have questions at the beginning, if you could please um, put them in the Q&A at the top, um, I believe it's at the top or the bottom of your screen, however your screen's set up, and we will um, get through them and answer them as we go along, or we will answer them at the end. Um, and Jody is gonna kind of help me out and she'll keep an eye on there. So if there's any technical questions, she can hopefully respond to those um, at the beginning, but any of the programmatic type questions, we will open it up at the end and we'll respond to those. Um, let's see, I wanna take a second to, I introduced myself, but introduce my colleagues who are on the, um, on the webinar with me and Jody is going to be presenting with me so I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, I'm Jody Moreno. I'm the Community Events and Special Projects Manager for the City of Elk Grove and I oversee the Event Sponsorship Grant Program or the ESG program for the city and uh, yeah like Alicia said I'm here to help. I'll be going over the event stuff. Um, Alicia's grants are a little bit more complicated and technical, and I'm sure that you'll have more questions for her, but I'm also here to answer questions as well, and I know most of you, so welcome back. Thanks. And then, Sarah, do you want to jump on and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Sarah Bontrager. I'm the City's Housing and Public Services Manager, um, so I work with Alicia on grants and then also do a lot of work with affordable housing and homelessness. I appreciate everyone joining us today. I think this is going to be a great session that Alicia has put together. Great. Okay, so the next is just a little overview on our agenda for today. Um, we're going to talk about the available grant funding opportunities that the city has currently open, the application process. For those of you that are returning, it is different than it has been in the past many years. Um, we're going to go through some application questions by grant type, talk a little bit about our grant policies, and then again, as I mentioned, open it up for question and answers um, at the end. So prior to that, um, I do have a few polls I'm going to sprinkle in here um, just to get a little bit of information about who is joining us today, as well as um, get your feedback on a couple of items. So um, our first poll is going to be just telling us who you are. Um, so it should pop up on your screen, hopefully. And if you could just type in your name and your organization that you're with, if you're a community member or a resident, you can just put that in the organization um, and we'll give you a few minutes to type in your answers. For those that are raising your hand, if you have a question, if you could type it in the Q&A section and um, if it's a technical question that Jody can help you with. It's just a little bit longer. It looks like we have about 65% of people responded. Okay, I think we're good at 75, oh, 78%. See, it changes quickly. <laughs> Another 10 seconds. We're having a few people that are not seeing the poll questions. 
No. Okay. Um, this might be the only one that they have a problem with. Um, I Zoom has a new format. Um, and if you do not have the newest version as of, I guess, November of last year, you may not see this one because it's a Q, um, it's a text answer. So um, if you don't see this one, it's okay. Go ahead and type your name and organization in the Q&A and we'll just note that you're here. We also have your registration email. Um, and then um, all the other ones, hopefully, we're gonna do another one in just a second. You should be able to, um, you should be able to answer. Oh, this one, it just gives short answers. So this one I can't share, but um, we will get a report to show everybody that um, is there. Um, we are going to talk a little bit more. Um, our next one, our next poll is um, looking at prior funding. So hopefully everyone sees this one. It's just a yes or no. It's just asking if your organization has applied for City of Elk Grove nonprofit funding before. Um, yes, no, unsure, or if you're not with an organization, you can um, enter select that. Another 15 seconds. Great, so this one gives us a good idea that uh, the majority of people are returning grantees or returning applicants at least, um, but we do have a good percentage of um, new people who are joining us, so about 24% um, who have never applied before. So that's good, um, gives us an idea of who's on the call today. Um, and then our final poll for right now, it's another quick one um, is, what type of funding opportunity your organization is interested in. Um, and if you know, you know, if you don't, you can put unsure. Um, we have four different funding opportunities. Again, if you're a resident or a community member and not applying for funds, um, there's the not applicable answer at the bottom. You can select all that apply. Another 10 seconds. Great. So Jody, look, the more more percentage for um, event sponsorships. So that's good. Um, but it's pretty even across the board. And then um, I think as some of you learn more about some of these uh, opportunities, you might change your answer a little bit and that's perfectly fine. Okay, so those are our polls for now. Uh, next, um, as I mentioned, um, the city does have um, four funding opportunities available currently for um, nonprofit organizations to apply for. These all four of these grants are for activities or events that occur between July 1st, 2022 and June 30th, 2023. So we plan ahead. Um, we start the process early to get through our application and review process. These items have to go through council, city council and be approved, as well as um, the CDBG program has some um, public hearing requirements and posting notices and things like that. So we have to backdate everything. So we start the process in January of each year for funding that begins July 1st. Um, we do have, um, yeah, agreements will be in place for July 1, um, 2022. 
some basic information about the four different grant types. Um, the first is the Community Service Grant, or, or what we call um, CSG. It is awarded annually by the City Council. Its general fund money um, activities must benefit Elk Grove residents. This is our most flexible of funding source for the program side um, for the activities and programs. It's for ongoing, it can be for ongoing program costs such as staffing and supplies. It can be for equipment purchases um, and some capital improvements to facilities. It's very flexible. The maximum award for any one organization under CSG annually is $100,000. Um, fundraising and one-time events are not eligible under this program, and that's uh, event sponsorship that we'll talk about today. Um, and funds should expand the capacity of the organization, not replace another funding source. Um, we're really looking for how our, the city's funding can help expand and grow programs um, versus replacing funding. The Community Development Block Grant, um, or CDBG, is um, funding that comes from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. The city is an entitlement grantee and we've received funds since 2003. Some of the funds that we receive, we get an annual allocation and some of the funds may be passed through to nonprofits and government entities for ongoing program costs. Um, so staffing supplies, et cetera, or capital improvements to facilities. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the budget, but. We are limited in the allocation of only 15% of what we're allocated can go towards um, programs and activities. Um, the rest need to go towards capital improvements. The goals of the um, CDBG program are to provide decent, safe, and sanitary housing, provide sustainable living environment, expand economic opportunities, and all programs that fall under the CDBG project must primarily benefit low income households. And that is determined by the um, annual income. And some examples for one person household, it's 50,750 currently. Um, that amount may change in the middle of 2022. Um, and a four person household is 72,500. I can give you additional numbers up to eight household numbers. So if you are interested and need more um, details on that to give you a better idea, you can reach out to me and I am happy to provide you with that information. The other funding opportunity that we have under programs and activities is um, the American Rescue Plan Act nonprofit grant. And this is new to this um, process this year. In March of 21, um, the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 was signed into law and the city is scheduled to receive um, almost $22 million over two years to respond to the COVID-19 public health emergency and its economic impacts. And through that funding, the city council approved 2.5 million of that funding to be made available as grants for nonprofits. Um, one part is for organizations facing economic hardship resulting from or exacerbated by the public health emergency. And the other focus is really programs and activities that address the needs of Elk Grove residents most impacted by the pandemic and its economic effects. We did um, have an application round for this, for that funding for the $2.5 million last October and um, went through that process. Through that process, only about half of the funding was allocated, um, 1.25. Um, and so what the council asked us to do was to take the shift the remaining funds to be allocated with this annual CSG and CDBG process and program. So for the um, economic hardship funding portion of the ARPA, that was allocated in November. So really for this current application, it's for programs or activities addressing needs or negative impacts of the COVID-19 public health emergency. So it's um, not the economic hardship side, but the programs and activities what is eligible. For the ESG or event sponsorship grant, um, basic information on that program, same as Alicia's grants that it's um, awarded annually and reviewed by the city council. 
And this is for Elk Grove based nonprofit organizations who want to hold a special event, whether that's virtual or in person. We know the event world has been very unpredictable these past two years. We empathize with you and we sympathize and we're here to help. So there are options when you're filling out the application, if you are going to be in person or virtual, or if you don't know, or if you're going to do a combination and there's an area there to fill that out. So trust us when we say we will work with you on these types of events because we understand we're in the same boat as you. The events need to take place in Elk Grove. They can't be organized around political or religious purposes. And if you have a fundraising component, you are eligible. It just needs to uh, serve a nonprofit that serves Elk Grove residents. Um, and then we have different types of funding and grants um, that we give out. And that is direct funding in the form of cash, city facility use. And you'll see that on the application with the different facilities that we have um, now here in the city and in-kind services, which includes um, police, public works, if you need to close a road for a run or a parade or things like that, um, marketing services. And then we also work with Republic services on some integrated waste for trash and recycle and dumpster services that we can provide that you can ask for. This is an estimated budget. Oh, and I didn't even change the title. So it's not 2122, it's 2223. Sorry about that. Um, this is our estimated budget for the 22-23 year. I will edit that before this gets posted um, or the slides get posted. For CSG, um, this amount is um, determined by the city budget process. And so this is um, a um, anticipated amount. It may um, change slightly. CDBG, this is our allocation. The 946,683 was our allocation for 21-22. We have not yet received um, information on what our allocation will be for, for the next funding year. So we're anticipating um, a similar amount. Again, I mentioned 15% of that can go towards public services. Um, and we generally put 15% um, or less towards administration of the grant and their balance goes towards capital projects. We, addition, we may have additional funding, most likely we'll have additional funding for capital projects from reallocated funds that um, were not spent in prior years um, that will um, increase that amount. Again, the final amount will be determined by HUD later in the year. And so we'll be able to up that, update that. For the American Rescue Plan Act funds, we have approximately 1.23 million remaining in the 2.5 that was allocated. Um, and then, yeah, you can see there for the event sponsorship grants, what we have ours are, are pre-allocated in our budget when we are putting together the budget for the public affairs division for the year. Um, and then once all the applicants apply, we have a review committee that goes through and then we um, recommend awards following that. But as you can see, the in-kind of facility use is a lot higher than the cash because police and public works and facilities tend to cost a lot more when you're asking for those things, but we wanna make sure that you have a safe event. Great, so now we're gonna talk just about some general information about um, the grants. There are two grant applications um, that you can apply for. For the community service grant, community development block grant, and the ARPA nonprofit grant, we lump all of those into one application. Um, so organizations can apply for more than one funding stream for a specific project or activities, um, or, um, they can apply for just one. And then we have the event sponsorship grant. So all of our questions for the first three programs are the same and it's in one application. Um, applicants can apply for um, under CSG, CDBG, ARPA, and or event sponsorship. There is no limit on the number of applications that an organization can submit. Um, you just need to remember that each event or each activity needs its own individual application. So if you are doing um, a public service activity, as well as you want to request funding for facility improvements, then you need to do submit those as individual applications. And if you want to submit an application for an event uh, run, and then you want to submit an application for um, a dinner, then you need to submit two separate applications. Um, and again, if you wanna submit an event and a public service, you can just two separate applications or however many you want. Um, it just helps 
keep it clean and the budget and be able to answer all of the different questions specific to that event or that activity. Um, the links to the applications are available on our website. This is a great link for you just information wise. Um, I have um, give, give you some more links, but this is the one that Alicia, if you can hear me, I think you froze on your end. Oh, there you go. Oh, I'm back. sorry. <laughs> That's okay. You were talking about the link. Oh, um, this is just a great link for you to have um, on record. It takes you to our city website and then it can help direct you to the different grant programs and the information there. Um, to be an eligible organization, it's for nonprofits that are corporations, associations, agencies, or faith-based organizations with a nonprofit status under the Internal Revenue Service Code. Um, government agencies that are independent of the City of Elk Grove are able to apply, as well as under CDBG, city departments are able to apply, for, um, and we have typically some for the capital projects. As a reminder, um, unless otherwise exempt under applicable law, applications and application materials are public records. So all information received from an applicant, whether it's received in connection with the grant application or in connection to any grant funded activities performed are subject to disclosure pursuant to the California Public Records Act. Um, again, unless otherwise exempt. So as you're submitting documents, if you have any sensitive information, such as bank account numbers or client names, those should not be included. Um, you can redact them and submit the information with that. Um, but if we do have a public request um, about our application process, requesting party may be given read-only access to the application. So just know everything you submit is subject to public record um, and that is available. Because we have two different applications, we also have two different deadlines. Um, we try to separate it to give you a little bit of a break and to help make it clear um, in terms of when you're applying. The CSG, CDBG, and ARPA applications, the deadlines are due February, or the deadline is due is February 15th, um, and the applications close at 11.59 p.m. It's an online system um, that automatically closes, so you will not be able to submit after that moment. And then the event sponsorship grant, the applications are due February 25th. This gives you guys a little bit of a break as well as it helps us identify um, occasionally, sometimes events come in under the CSG program and we can flag them and redirect that organization to apply under um, the event sponsorship application. So it gives us a little bit of a ability to do that. All right, so just some general grant information. We're going to talk mostly about this or about CSG, CDBG, and the ARPA nonprofit grant program right now. Um, the types of eligible activities this is an incomplete list, um, but we wanted to give you an idea of some of the things that you could apply for funding um, services for low income households, youth, seniors, persons with disabilities, persons experiencing homelessness persons with mental health illness, veterans and fosters youth. Those are all some of our priority populations in the community. Um, food assistance programs, job training and education, recreation and sports programs, um, housing assistance programs, um, improvements to existing facilities, acquisition or purchase of new facilities. Um, and I think I skipped one. Oh, public safety and crime prevention is another option. And then for the ARPA funding, um, programs or activities that address a need or negative impact resulting from the COVID-19 public health emergency. Um, so those are, again, it's an incomplete list. If you have a question or aren't really clear about a program that you want to propose or would like to request funding for, at any point, you can reach out to me and we can have a conversation and talk about it. and. Um, kind of help you determine what the best way to apply for what you're looking for. So the, the good question is, do I apply for CSG, CDBG, ARPA, more than one? How do I apply? Um, so most organizations should apply under the Community Service Grant. Um, it is 
the most flexible funding source that we have, whereas CDBG and ARPA have additional eligibility and reporting requirements. Um, but with that said, most a lot of programs are eligible for more than one type of funding. So if your organization has data on the number of low-income persons served or can real, realistically estimate that number, and if your organization is willing to collect income and demographic data from every person served, um, then CDBG is a good program for you to apply for. Um, the ARPA grant, again, it's for an organization that can identify a need or a negative impact that the public health emergency has had on their target population, and that the proposed activity that has been um, addresses that identified need or negative impact. Um, one of the main things with um, the ARPA funding is that, you know, while the COVID-19 public health emergency has affected many aspects of American life and our lives, our daily lives, eligible uses under this category must be in response to the disease itself or the harmful consequences of the economic disruption resulting from or exacerbated by the COVID-19 public health emergency. So thinking about that in terms of your program. Um, on the application, there's an opportunity for you just to select the funding sources that you're um, interested in, and you can select more than one um, or all of them. The um, applying for more than one will not hurt your chances. It really gives, um, gives us an opportunity as city um, staff to help you determine which is the best funding source where we have funds available um, and what might best fit the program if it's eligible. So um, it doesn't hurt to check all the boxes. You just have more questions to answer if you're applying for more than um, one funding source. Um, again, these are incomplete lists for budget items of um, what is eligible and what is ineligible. Um, under eligible costs, personnel, staff, um, lease or rental space, materials and supplies for your programs, um, local travel is eligible, and indirect costs of no more than 10% of direct costs unless you have um, an approved indirect cost rate. And in the application, it'll tell you how to um, attach that. Ineligible costs would be anything, program or service that promotes religion, political activities, marketing incentives or fundraising, payments or debts, or of debts or expenses incurred prior to the grant period, so prior to July 1st, 2022, entertainment furnishings or personal properties, um, or any costs that are not directly related to providing services to Elk Grove residents. So there's a lot of flexibility in the costs that the city can cover under the different grants, but we do require documentation for all of it. Um, and this is probably the least fun part of, of uh, my job is working to make sure, is going back and forth with grantees to make sure that we have all of the documentation needed to um, process reimbursements. So all costs need to be clearly related to the activity that the city funds and acceptable documentation can include payroll summaries, timesheets, invoices, um, receipts paid, mileage logs, et cetera. So when you're requesting funding and writing out your budget, think about the documentation um, that you have um, or that you would be able to gather to document those expenses and um, help determine which budget categories you're requesting funding for. So just keep it in mind as you're developing that. Um, if the activity does serve non-Elk Grove residents, we know a lot of our partners um, are serve programs that might be countywide or um, in other areas. The organization needs to have acceptable accounting methods to allocate or separate out those costs. So we will look at the amount or the percentage base of Elk Grove residents served, and we need to be able to show that only that percentage of those program costs are being um, requested as reimbursement from the city. And then um, funding requests, if an organization is not going to be providing increased service or helping additional people than previous years, so if it's an existing program, um, we do ask that the funding request explain why the organization's current funds are insufficient. You need to give us some sort of a picture and understanding of why um, for something that's been ongoing that you've already had in place, why your current funding is insufficient to continue that. 
Um, and again, if the proposed activity will serve non Elk Grove residents, please calculate the percentage of time spent on the Elk Grove population um, and request no more than the percentage for that in any one budget item. So that's CSG, CDBG, and ARPA. So now we're going to move on to events. Yeah, for ESG, this is just some general information. We have um, more detailed information further in our presentation when you get into actually applying. Um, we have an eligible events list as well. This is also incomplete because I'm sure there's a lot of um, new things that have come on the horizon as far as events are concerned, but these are the kind of types that we see on most of our applications, whether it's a concert or a performance of some type in the community, a festival or a fair, a parade, uh, sports tournaments are eligible to apply as long as it's open to the public and in Elk Grove, a run or a walk a race like you will see uh, running of the elk or uh, the gobble wobble, or there's a lot of different runs that we support in the city that help out our local nonprofits run for hunger, et cetera. And those are really big fundraisers for our nonprofits. Um, if you're doing a lecture series, a symposium, any kind of dinner, uh, reception, a lunch, breakfast, you know, we have a bounty on the boulevard. We have a lot of things like that that we support. So if there's an event that you're doing like that, you know, any kind of event that you're bringing to the city, we like to see, we like to see new things. You know, our council really wants to see visitation. So think about that when you're um, filling out your scope and telling us what kind of event it is. And as we talked about before, it could be in person, it could be virtual, or it could be a combination of both. And we wanna talk about, um, like we talked at the top, we do know that uh, COVID-19 has put us all kind of in a pickle and we got that, we're all pivoting, right? Uh, we wanna make sure that you know that we follow Sacramento County um, and state any regulations around COVID-19. So if the county comes down with a mandate that masks are required for indoor events. And if we are sponsoring your event, we will require that you follow that county law. If the state comes down with a law that you can't have more than 5,000 people in an outdoor event, then we're gonna pass that along as well. We will follow all of the local laws, regulations, and any federations around COVID-19. And we're doing the same with the city events. So we'll share any information we get with you when things change and see how you might want to adapt your event. And you can just always be in touch. Um, I'm in touch with a lot of our grantees and I'm here to help. Um, if you need to change a date, a location, or if you even need to cancel, we've canceled many events over the last 18 months and that's okay. And it does not hurt your chances in a subsequent year of applying for a grant. We don't look down on you. We know how hard it is. Um, if there are substantial changes after the preliminary awards have been determined, you know, that could change your funding, um, use of facilities, et cetera. So we'll just, we don't hold it over for you and postpone it till the next year. You know, you use it during that year because we're, our budget's on a fiscal year, year to year. So it doesn't roll over into the next year, unfortunately. It's just that that event was canceled. So you can't move it over. And then the types of sponsorship uh, requests, again, we talked about this a little bit at the top and we'll go out a little bit more further in the presentation, direct funding in the form of cash, facility use. Um, we have Old Town Plaza, which just recently was refaced and reopened and is beautiful in the heart of Old Town. That's a, a beautiful event space you could think about using. District 56 has an indoor facility that seats up to 500 or 470-ish if you want to do a dinner or if you're doing a standing event, it can hold more. We have the outdoor facility, which is the Avenue of the Arts, and there's also a veterans lawn out there. And then we also have the aquatic center. That's for local swim teams only looking to do a swim meet or have an event open to the public that is like a swim clinic. And then the in-kind, as we talked before, police department service, that's traffic management and overall event safety, road closures, waste management, and we offer marketing and promotion on our city platforms. Great, so next is the fun part of the application process. And for those of you who are returning applicants, um, it looks different. Um, we as a city had um, go out on a regular basis or um, every so many years have to put all of our procurement out to bid. And so we did that process this past um, December and selected a new um, grants management software or system. So it's an online system. Um, and we're gonna, um, we're rolling, we're learning about it as, as we go through this process. So um, it is called Web Grants. It's an online application. Um, all applications must be completed and submitted via this process, um, this website. So paper applications will not be um, accepted. 
uh, applicants must create a web grants account in order to apply. So all individuals who will need access to your application, your organization's application should register for an account. Each registration is approved by city staff. So I go in and approve every time you register, I get um, an email notice that says um, that we have a new application or a new registration that we need to approve. So um, it could take a couple up to a couple of days, depending on when you do it. If you submit um, a request over the weekend, and I don't necessarily see it over the weekend, um, it could take a couple of days. Generally, I get to it within a couple hours when I'm um, on the computer, and I've been checking in over the weekends too to make sure that they get it. But if you don't get that acceptance right away, just know that that is um, that is why. So please do not wait to the last minute to apply because you do have to register first and get approved before you can apply. Um, and then if you, this is a fun part, an exciting part about this new system. If you're a grant writer or a volunteer and you're working with more than one organization, we can link your personal account to more than one registration or more than one organization. So you only have to have one login um, for you, and then you can select which organization you are submitting an application on behalf of. Um, and as we already mentioned, you can submit multiple applications for different projects in the system, um, all under the same registration. So this is just a quick screenshot of what um, it looks like when you're going to go to the website. Um, if you are new, you're going to click register, click here to register. If you're returning, you will enter in your user ID and password information. Um, and if you just want to go and look at the current funding opportunities and kind of read the details, but you can't actually see the application, then you'll click on that view current funding opportunities. Um, a couple of things, these announcements, they may, it may not always look like this, they may change or um, add items to it. Um, if you're a first time user, there are steps and instructions there. If you look right here, I have created a step-by-step -step instruction guide on how to register. Um, so it walks you through the whole process and you, there's screenshots. Um, so I encourage you to look at that, um, especially if you wanna see what information you need to register prior to registering, um, prior to clicking that click here to register button. Um, and then if you are, again, if you're talking about, if you're working with multiple organizations, please do not register more than once. Um, once you have an active registration and you've been accepted and you have your login and your password, um, then just email me um, that this link, this email link goes to my email, but um, you can email me and I will connect additional organizations to you. So you just have to reach out to me and I can do that within the system from our side. Um, and then one of the other great things um, is I created a step-by-step -step instruction on how to submit an application. I highly encourage you to read through this and to look through. I put a lot of different tips and tricks on the application process, screenshots um, to help walk through it. Again, this is a new system for all of us. Um, so we are learning as we go. Um, and I'm hopeful that this helps walk you through um, the process. If you have any questions as you're going through it, depending on which application, if it's the CSG, CDBG, ARPA one, reach out to me and I'm happy to assist you. Um, and if it's the event sponsorship, um, reach out to Jody, and she can help guide you through some of that. We do have a pretty awesome view on, the, um, uh, on our end of the system that we can go in and look at your application as you're creating it. And we can kind of help walk through and troubleshoot some of those, which we did not have in a previous system. So um, hopefully we can offer um, some good technical assistance if you have any questions. Um, so I did talk a little bit about the registration. This, the registration registers personal contact information as well as the organization's information. So if you are the first person registering an organization, you should try and enter as much information as possible. Um, this information is then, it's important because it's then gonna be tied to every single person who registers for that organization. And then when more people register under that organization, um, they just put the basic information and then I will merge all of the accounts under one organization. Um, if you don't have something that is asked for, you can add it later under my profile. 
once you're all set up. So don't fret if there's something that um, you don't have at your fingertips when you go to register, you can add it later. And if it's something um, that we need, then we will send you a notice within the system saying that um, you have some information that you need to submit still. Um, if your organization, again, is already registered, you only need to complete the red um, required fields so that I can connect you to the correct organization. Um, all applicants requesting CDBG or ARBA funds must also have a DUNS number, um, which is a unique non-indicative nine-digit identifier issued um, and maintained by Duns and, Dun Street and Bradstraw. I always say that wrong. Um, it, it verifies the existence of a business entity globally. Um, so there's links within the application and within the system of how to get one if you don't have one, but that is something that we will ask upon registration. Um, the other thing that we'll talk about later a little bit, but we do ask for some attachments um, at registration for the organization. Um, we ask for your articles of incorporation, a list of board of directors, um, and some other, your IRS um, certification letter. This is fun because it attaches it to the organization. So then when you submit an application, you do not have to resubmit that information for each application. So for those organizations that are submitting multiple applications, this is already tied to your account and it's already in there um, one time. So it's helpful at the um, if you're applying next year and some of the information may have changed, like a board of directors list, we will ask for an updated copy then. Um, but it's really great to be able to include that in there. So the next is um, on the application and when you're going in to apply. So this is what it looks like once you log in, you have um, your, this is where your username would be um, and your, your organization information. There's your dashboard and this will come into play if you're awarded funding and receive a grant. Um, and then there's um, this link that says funding opportunities or this toggle here. And you're gonna then go over to the um, currently posted funding opportunities and you'll see the two different posted opportunities. So the community development block grant, CSG and ARPA one, and then the event sponsorship grant. So you wanna make sure that you're selecting the correct funding type for what you want to apply for. Um, and once you select that, you can look at um, the, um, Opportunity details and descriptions, which really talks about the eligibility of the organization, kind of some of the grant requirements um, and the funding information. Um, and then you'll determine if it's um, if it is the correct funding source for what you want. And if it's not, you just back out into the funding sources and you go to the other one to make sure that that's what you want. Um, I think a question was asked if we can apply for more than one event in each year. The answer is yes, you can apply for as many events as you want. Um, they just all have to be individual um, applications. I was in the middle so, of typing. Beat me to it, Alicia. <laughs> Sorry, I, I found my question and answers and I opened it and so it's right there. And so I saw it. Um, <laughs> so the, um, the next, oh, when you're registering um, or when you're going to submit your or start an application, you have the option of adding additional applicants or users. So if you have, um, you know, several other people who have already registered accounts um, and you want to connect them to your application, you can do that um, at the time that you start your application or you can always add them in later um, once they register their account. But this is a way for multiple people to be going in and working on your application together. Um, there is an audit log in the system. So each person is logged in as themselves and it will show that whoever was the last person to edit something. So it's not that you all go in and it's just anyone has a chance to do something. There's an audit log and it shows who was in there and what they were, um, what they were working on. Um, and only authorized applicants are able to see your application. You can always add them later under the general information page. Um, all application components or forms, um, they're kind of interchangeable terms, and required questions are required and required attachments have to be submitted and completed before you can submit. Again, that step-by-step -step how to apply document that is on the main page gives you screenshots and gives you 
um, so much information in terms of how you complete a form and how you um, so to make sure and check it off. And then if you are saving it and something looks to be missing, it, it walks through all of those things. So I highly encourage you to walk through um, that document before you start an application to get an idea of um, what the steps are. Prior to submitting your application, you can edit as often as you like up to the deadline. Um, if you do not submit before the deadline, it will not automatically submit it for you. So you need to make sure that you do complete everything and submit it, um, but you have the ability to go in anytime, day or night. It's an online system um, and edit your application. Um, and you can submit more than one application for each funding opportunity. Um, next is something that is different um, from our old system. The application does not save automatically when you're clicking between questions. So it's a little inconvenient, um, but there are save form tabs everywhere, green buttons that say save form or um, tells you where to save and how to save. Again, walking through that step-by-step -step instructions really points those out and shows you where that is, but just know that if you um, close your web browser without saving, then it's not, the information's not going to be there. Um, if you use your um, backspace in your web browser without using the web grants menu backspace, um, then it likely will not um, save your information. If you use the, the menu within the web grants, um, it will pop up a box that says you're about to leave without saving something. Do you want to do that? So making sure that you're using the menu within web grant. Again, that's highlighted in the step-by-step -step instruction guides. Um, blue text almost always indicates a clickable link. Either it's within the system, within the web grant system, or to an external source. Um, so if there's generally more information um, at that link. Red Fields are shown, uh, required fields are shown in red text with a red asterisk. Um, and if you try to save something um, without having that red required information in there, um, it'll flag it um, and say you can't save it. Or if you try to save a form and nothing happens and it the say it still says save form and it just looks like the same old screen and nothing changed, um, it didn't go back to the menu, then um, you're likely missing text in a required field. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't pop up and tell you exactly where that is. Um, so you just want to scroll up and down the form and look for any red text that's identifying saying this field is required. We try to keep each form um, relatively short and break them up into multiple forms so that um, you didn't have to scroll too much and look for that. But um, if it looks like nothing happens when you went to save, then um, that's likely the issue. So just look for that red text that said this field is required before. Um, navigating away from that. Um, a couple tips on entering text. Only plain text is allowed, so fancy formatting does not show up. Um, if you want to separate paragraphs with a blank line that will help um, break up the text and the information, please be aware of the maximum character counts for each text box. Um, it will show you if you're typing directly into the text box, it'll show you as the um, amounts change, the numbers reduce. But this is especially important when you're cutting and pasting from an outside document. Um, when you're cutting and pasting from where there's a little box that you can click and cut and paste so it fixes your formatting. But um, if you cut and paste something into a text box, it's not going to warn you that you're over character limit. It's just going to stop copying the text at that character limit. Um, and it won't pop up red at the end bottom of the box. It won't show anything. It's just going to cut off your text. So it's really important to proofread when you're after you cut and paste and that it has all of the information that you intend to have in it. We tried to make um, the text box for um, certain categories that we knew would have a lot of information, we tried to make them larger, um, like 3,000 characters. So it's a pretty substantial amount of um, space for you to put in there. Um, but just know that you should check um, before submitting or before marking it is complete um, because it will more warn you. The other thing is, is if you're cutting and pasting, not all spe special characters will show up and they may change. So especially if you just cut and paste into the text box versus using the little ability to, um, there's a box that says 
cutting and pasting from Word that you can use. Um, so sometimes apostrophes show up as question marks. Um, I've seen that in a couple of people who've cut and pasted their mission into their registrations. So um, just know, again, proofread and go back and make those corrections if you're cutting and pasting um, before you submit. The attachments, um, there are attachment requirements for each application type. Again, we have some of that general attachments that are with your organization when you register, um, which will carry forward. So the, those are helpful, but each different application has a list of required documents and you must upload a document for every required document. So the ones that are indicated in red um, or you will not be able to submit. If your organization does not have a certain document or you have a question about a specific document, um, please contact myself or Jody, depending on the program, and let us talk you through it. Um, because again, you cannot submit an application without something in that space. So we will walk you through um, what you need to do if you do not have a specific type of document that they're requesting. Um, we do ask that you check the document requirements early. Um, and one of the first things that you do when you go into your application and you start an application, because some of the items may take a little while for you to pull together. And um, again, you have to have it uploaded before you can submit. So making sure that you have time to gather those documents. Um, the Secretary of State Certificate of Status. Um, this is always a tricky one. Um, it's the, um, the link is there. It's also listed in our website. Um, and we're gonna talk about this in the grant requirement to be registered in good standing with Secretary of State, as well as the Red Charitable Trusts, if required by law. Um, and so you'll go to this website and you can either for the certificate of status, um, which I think it takes a little bit of time um, and may not be free, or you can just do um, a print screen of the screen showing that the organization is active and in good standing and do a print PDF and then upload that as your um, attachment. Um, and then we do have an option for adding supporting materials. They're not required, but if there's anything else that you would like to add um, to your application um, that you would like the city to have with that application. After you submit your application, um, Web Grants will send you an email confirming your submission. Um, once submitted, you applications cannot be edited. So please make sure that you've proofread and done everything. Um, Prior to submitting, um, we do not have the option of reopening. Um, we can create and kind of edit once we're in the review process, but we don't have an option to send it back to you for you to, um, to work on it um, as prior to submission. So just know that. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Web Grants closes the application T9. So please don't wait to the very last minute to be in there. Um, we are, staff is available to assist and to answer questions the day of the deadline, um, and we are around, um, but we are not around at 11.59 p.m. <laughs> Technical assistance. Um, I mentioned two of the step-by-step -step guides that I have created. They are both available uh, on the main page of the web grants when you go to that link, um, and they are also available on our city grants page at the very um, as we get through the system a little bit more and are managing grants and awards and getting through the review process and things like that, I'm sure I will create more step-by-step -step guides for each kind of process. Um, but right now it's the how to register and how to apply guides. Um, there is an online help and an ask a question button at the top of the page in web grants. Um, the online help offers some guidance in terms of navigating that page question, we'll submit a question to program staff through the web grant system. So you are more than welcome to use that, um, but you can also just email or call us directly and we can answer it um, in through email or outside of the system. But if you want to keep a record of it with your application, then the ask a question um, process is fine. It will just respond and it'll come back to you through web grants. Um, and then the city staff contacts for um, the programs are listed below. It's myself for CDBG, CSG, and ARPA. And then for the event sponsorship, Jody Moreno, um, and then Carrie Monty also works with her on that project. 
So that was a lot about web grants. Um, it is a really cool system. We're excited about it. Um, and again, we're learning along with you. So uh, we have patience and understanding if it's a little, um, you know, it takes a little bit to get used to, um, but we think it's a great system for navigating and helping get all of the information. Again, if you have questions as you're going through it, please reach out to us and we can um, help you with that. Um, so I'm going to take a quick break of talking and do one more poll. Um, and this is I'm going to ask you your population served. So um, if you are a, it only gives me 10 options. Um, so if you are a resident or community member, um, you can just skip answering this question. Um, but for those of you that are working with an organization, you could please identify the population served by your organization's programs and you can select more than one. About another 10 more seconds. I know you guys can't see this side, but it's super fun to see the numbers jump because it tells you how many people answered and what percentage, and it's kind of fun to watch. All right. So we have about 83% of people um, responded and it's a good mix of um, those that are served. Great. Thanks for that. Give me a nice little break of talking for a minute. Next. Um, I'm going to go into some of the CSG, CDBG, and ARPA application questions and just walk you through a little bit of the information that we're asking um, in the grant application. Um, again, there are different application components or forms um, that you're going to click through in the system. That step-by-step -step guide has screenshots and shows you what this looks like, um, so I encourage you to take a look at that. For the CDBG, CSG, and ARPA application, um, it's your general information, project overview, organization information, the CDBG, ARPA eligibility, budget, attachments, and then your registrations and certifications. So for um, the general information, I didn't make a slide for, it's basically your um, application title and um, some basic information in terms of that. So it's pretty self-explanatory. This is where you also are adding um, your additional applicants or users if you have other people in the system that you want to access the application. For project overview, um, we ask for a project description and narrative. So describing the specifics of the activity, the who, what, when, where, um, and then indicating how you plan on spending the funding if awarded. Um, it's really your opportunity to give us kind of the meat of what it is that you're looking to do. Um, and then we also ask some project beneficiary questions. So we ask place of residence. We're asking them which, um, you, which county they're in. Um, we're asking you to estimate your numbers for July 1 through June 30th. Use your best estimates on prior based on previous years um, or if it's a new program, we want you to estimate um, as best. We want you to include only people who are receiving service. So not all people who could use the service if desired, 
um, but those who will actually be using the service. So I think in a lot of times we receive applications that say, well, all of Elk Grove could use it. And so we get a population for the entire city when um, your actual proposed program isn't gonna serve the entire city, it'll serve a portion of those. So making sure that you're accurate in those um, and being realistic because these goals are ultimately gonna go into a grant agreement if you're awarded. Um, and so there are things that we're gonna hold you accountable to. Um, and then we're also asking the participant income level. Um, so looking at um, if they're low income um, or um, non-low income. Um, and we're asking, make sure that the numbers for your total numbers in the income level is the same as the total numbers of place of re residence. Those are typically areas where the numbers are different um, of who's being served. And so we typically have to go back to grantees asking them to clarify that question. Next is looking at organization information. So this is really talking about your organization as itself and the capacity that you have to be able to implement this program. So looking at what other grant funding you have applied for in the past two years, providing us some information on that. Um, you know, this is important because in the past council has indicated that um, grantees should be actively looking to reduce their reliance on city funding. So they want to see that you're not just looking for city funding, but you're looking for other um, funding sources as well um, as an organization. We do ask um, about federal assistance received related to COVID-19. We provide some of those examples, um, Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, if you've received CDBG CV funds or CARES Act funding, we would like to know um, that and the uses for those. Um, we also have a question on partial funding. Oftentimes, the um, grant or applicants are not awarded the full amount that they're requesting. And so we need to know if you're awarded an amount that is less than what you're requesting, how does that impact the implementation of your program? How would that change? Um, would it reduce the number served? Would it reduce the amount, the duration or the amount of times you're able to offer that service during um, a week or whatever the time period is? So please make sure that you're explaining that. Um, you also have the option of saying that you're not interested in receiving partial funding. So you would like the full funding um, or um, you would not like to have a partial funding. Um, we also are asking organizational assets. So looking at the total assets, um, that you have, which can often be found in an annual audit, um, how much of that is liquid assets, so including cash or assets that could be easily converted to cash, such as stocks, real property, material supplies are not considered liquid assets, so making sure that you're clear on that. Um, and then if any of those um, assets are restricted, uh, making sure that you're identifying that in the application. For CDBG and L ARPA eligibility, as I mentioned, these have some additional reporting requirements um, and eligibility standards. So we have additional questions. Um, we are asking on this form, um, we do ask the fund type that you're requesting and you can select all that apply. And then the remaining questions on the form will tell you if you're not applying for CDBG, you can list it as not applicable. Or if you're not applying for ARPA, list it as not applicable. So um, there's the CDBG pro proposed goal. So really kind of that broad scope, general statement of what the activity or program's purpose is um, and what your end result is going to be after um, implementing the activity. The proposed objectives, talking about the specific results achieved within the timeframe, so that July 1st to June 30th, some of those um, you know, SMART goals, the specific measurable action-oriented, realistic, and time-bound, what are some of your goals for the, and objectives for um, this project? And then your proposed act, outcomes or performance measures. Um, how do you know when you've succeeded in um, implementing the program? What are those measurement and evaluation tools that you're going to be using? And what are some of the short or long-term benefits um, for the proposed activity? We also have COVID-19 objective questions in there um, and pandemic recovery revitalization questions to talk really about how, if you're looking for ARPA funding, um, what is the need, identified need or impact um, that your program is proposed to address um, and those type of information. So the next slide, I'm not really going to go over. I'm providing it here just as an example, talking about, you know, how to do a goal, objective and an outcome. Um, 
and gives you some kind of clear measurable items that you want to put in your um, in your application. For the budget, um, there's a budget summary. We have common categories of expenditures that are pre-filled in. Um, these are same for everybody else, and it's really to help us build our template and our um, system in the budget so that when we um, do award funds that we're able to reimburse um, and within the system. There are some other categories that can be used for planned expenditures that do not fit in the provided. So if you're seeing something that doesn't really fit in any of the categories that we have, um, we do have some other categories that you can use. Um, and then just make sure you're identifying what that what you put in the other category. Um, there's a area for personnel expenses. We would like you to show all relevant personnel um, who will be working in some fashion on the proposed project, even if they're not being funded with the funds that you're requesting. Um, so even if it's not city funding, we would like to know the staff that are working on that project or that will be um, anticipated and what percentage of FTE um, and their information. So there's a, um, a form that really that you're just going to add row for each staff person um, that would dedicate time to that project. Um, and then there's a section for a budget narrative um, and for each category of funding that you're requesting funding under for city. We're asking you to provide a description of what is anticipated expenses are um, and then include how those funds will be spent. So program supplies, say you're asking for $500 in program supplies, detail out what program supplies entails. Um, is that um, you're asking for um, paper and, uh, you know, pens, or if you're asking for, um, if you're a food service program, are you asking for um, food products to be able to provide that? Um, so making sure that you have um, those items. The budget summary also has an area, it has the categories of the city funding requested, um, and then any matched funds that you have, and in-kind services funds. So we're really looking to get a big picture of how much the proposed activity is going to cost in general as a whole, and then what percentage and what amount you're requesting funding from the city. Um, we strongly recommend applications requesting more than 5,000 include a more detailed budget as a supporting documentation. So um, under the attachment side is where you can put that under supporting documents. So having more of um, a stronger application. Um, so for personal expenses, one of the questions is including volunteer hours. Um, you can put that under in kind in the budget summary. Um, if you do have a dedicated volunteer position that you know will be working towards this, and again, this is for the CDBG, CSG, and um, ARPA for the program side, um, you can list a volunteer position under personnel expenses. You would just list zero as um, their salary totals, um, but you would list what percentage of FTE you're using them, um, but just not putting any funding allocated towards that. Um, but I would only do that if it's a dedicated um, volunteer position that you know you're using. If it's more, um, you have random volunteers who help um, with little bits and pieces, then um, I wouldn't necessarily include them under personnel. All right. Um, did I, nope, I didn't. Okay. Um, so application review criteria. So we will be looking through um, applications for project feasibility, um, budget reasonableness, agency capacity, the impact on the priority needs, um, new or increased service, whether your organization is offering something new or increased, leveraged funds that you bring um, or the organization brings to the project. Um, and self-support plans. Um, for the new um, or impact on prior to your needs, um, you know, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this before, we do, for the CDBG program, we do a five-year consolidated plan and we do an annual action plan. And those documents are on our website. You can get to them through that grants link. Um, and it really shows what the community um, and the city has determined are the priority areas of focus for the next, um, we're already at two years into it, I guess, um, but for a five-year planning period. Um, and so that'll give you some ideas in terms of what those priority needs are in those areas. Um, and at the end, I'm gonna to talk to you about a survey that we're doing where we collect that information on an annual basis to kind of keep an idea of 
what the needs of the community are. The application review process is once your applications are submitted and then after the deadline, um, we will go through them and review them for eligibility and completeness. Um, and we do send questions, follow-up questions to most applicants. Um, you will receive those um, as soon as we can get through the applications, uh, time between February 17th and March 5th. Um, they will be sent through the web grant system. I do not have a step-by-step -by -step guide for that yet because I'm still learning that process. But once um, I do, we will um, I'll send that out and communicate that with you of how to find those questions and how to respond to those questions and answer those. Um, it'll obviously be before you get those questions, um, but I will give you guidance on that. Um, and then we do ask that you respond to all questions um, so that we can fairly evaluate your application. Um, we do have the opportunity, as I mentioned at this time, to go in and um, it's called negotiate, but go through if, um, and ask for clarification on anything. So if for some reason your numbers didn't add up of numbers served under place of residence and um, income levels, then we can go back and ask you to provide clarification and update that um, through the application. And then here is a timeline of um, our anticipated timeline for our process. We've re released the application. We're at today the um, public meeting. Uh, and then the deadline is again February 15th, and then we go through the review period. Um, we anticipate taking preliminary awards to City Council on March 23rd, and then the CDBG action plan will be our public review period um, between um, April and May, and final award will be taken to City Council back in May with a funding year beginning in July. You get a break. You can have a sip of water here. I need to go refill it, but yeah. <laughs> and I just need to take a moment to say that Alicia deserves a lot of kudos. We learned a new system in a very short amount of time, and she's leading the charge and has done a great job. And like she said, watch, uh, go through her notes and her step-by-step, because -step, I had to go through it too when we were testing. So she's done a great job of going through this new software and really being able to guide everyone. So you reach out to me with a question. I'm probably going to reach out to her, but I'm learning alongside with her, but she's a master at this. Okay, let's do a general overview of ESG applications. Um, as we've talked about before, you have a little bit longer time to turn those in February 25th and late applications will not be accepted. So we're talking about the components on our farms. It's not as detailed um, as Alicia's grants. Ours are a little bit more simple. So you're probably, after you fill hers out and you get to the ESG, you'll be like, this is a breeze. You, you'll have it down, you'll know what you're doing. So that's great. We ask for general information, uh, information and overview of your event what kind of sponsorship you're requesting, some details about your event and your audience, um, what your budget is for the event. And we do ask for those some, same registrations and certifications, um, Secretary of State, uh, Register of Charitable Trusts. And then there are some attachments that are required and, and some that aren't, like we're gonna require you know your budget and things like that. But if you have an event flyer, already done, we'd love to see it. If you have a map, we'd love to see it, but we know that some of those things are still in development. So there are some that re are required, like Alicia said in red, and then there's some that aren't. <laughs> um, under the overview tab, when you are in web grants, uh, you're gonna see that you need to let us know what kind of platform it is, in-person, virtual, or combination. And then if you click in person, there's going to be another branching question that comes up that's going to ask you what your plan is in case the public health orders change. So I would make sure you have a contingency plan. Um, it's not a fun thing to do to have two plans for every event. That's kind of how we're operating um, in my job and at the city as well. We're planning two different ways for all of our events in case um, public health orders change. So just something to keep in mind. It doesn't have to be completely set in stone, but maybe you just have an idea that either we're going to cancel if it's not allowed or we're going to look to host it differently. So just share that information with us if anything changes. And then under the event description, we're wanting you to be really specific there. And it's going to give you some information on the application, but we take that paragraph that you write and we put that into your contract under the scope of work where we describe the event. So, you know, you're going to say, oh, we're going to have vendors, we're going to have food trucks. We're going to have live entertainment, tickets are $40, et cetera. So if you put in the event description and, you know, just make sure that you give us a lot of meat there that we can use so we don't have to reach back out to you for that. 
Um, you're also going to be asked for the dates of your event and the location. Um, we know some people uh, don't have a date. Uh, we really hope you do have a date. If you don't, put in the anticipated date. And if that changes, you can reach out to me directly. We'll work with you. Just know that, um, especially for a facility use, District 56, now that we're coming out of a COVID world, although we're kind of on hold again, it's it's booked for like two years. We do have weekends open. Know that like Thursday nights are great. Sundays are great too. So have in mind that you might have an alternate date, but just put in the one you have and then we will work with you. And also for the hours of event, you'll put the hours of the actual event, but we also wanna know your setup time and your teardown time because we're billed for those hours for any facility that you're using. And we'll wanna make sure that it is um, reserved for you during those hours as well. For the type of sponsorship um, that you're going to be requesting, um, like we said, you can ask for a facility. And I did mention this a little bit, but Old Town Plaza is now open as a rentable event venue, along with um, the other um, things that we talked about, District 56, indoor, outdoor, and um, the aquatic center. Please note that your grant will cover the cost of the rental facilities, but it does not cover the other costs. So if there's security that's needed, um, if you want staffing on site, uh, you know, when you rent the plaza, we do open the bathrooms. There's some things that come with it, but there's not staff on site the whole time. It's sort of like when you rent a park space, when you're renting that outdoor venue. So please note that there are other things that could be needed that will be a hard cost to you that are not covered in the grant. The money for in-kind is specifically just for the rental. Um, again, we will work with you on alternate dates if your first preference is not available. And then there is an other category on there, and that's things like if you're asking for the mayor to come speak at your event, or you're going to be giving away a goodie bag to everyone and you would like a city item included in the bag, or you're looking for someone to MC. Those are not guaranteed things, but that's something that we can always send out to the council or um, to me, I do all of the city goodies as well. So just that's kind of what other means or anything else that you want to tell us about the type of sponsorship you're requesting. For the in-kind services, um, please note that police can never be used as security. They are only there for event safety and when we close roads to do traffic control. So if you're doing an alcohol event and you're wanting PD there as security, um, that's not something that they will do. They're just there to make sure that your event is safe and you'll have to work with them and us to make sure you have a bonded security company that PD trusts on site that they can work hand in hand with. Um, we also don't have any equipment available for grantees to rent. We don't have tables and chairs and things like that. Um, Parks and Rec typically had a lot of that kind of thing. So grantees had assumed that the city does as well. And even on, on, on my events, I think I have eight tables and like 20 chairs. So I'm also having to rent those for events. So please keep that in mind. And if you do switch to a virtual event, um, we are unable to provide any kind of technical support or set up the Zoom for you or things like that. When we move into the details tab, um, there is a question about road closures. So if you're doing a parade or a run or you want to do an event on a street and you want to close a road, there's going to be some additional requirements. You'll have to file a street use permit and then that triggers a meeting with myself and public works and police to make sure that we can confirm all of your logistics. Um, and then permits are an additional cost and that's also not covered by the grant. We'll close the street and we'll pay for all the officers and the barricades to be there, but you'll have to pay for the actual permit, which, which isn't very much for a nonprofit. And then some of the other details, we're asking about food and drink. So if you're having food trucks or especially if you're having tented food vendors, that kind of triggers another thing where um, you know, CSD fire could get involved because anyone cooking under a tent has to have specific setup. Or if you have a generator with a tented vendor, the generator has to be a certain amount of feet behind their tent. So there are some rules um, with CSD fire that we partner with on them. So just know that and just know if you have a lot of food vendors that you could be required also to have a health permit with Sacramento County Department. Now, if you're a nonprofit, they waive that fee. They just want you to fill out the paperwork. And it's very easy. We do it for all of our events. We have to pay. Um, it's a hefty fine for us, but for a nonprofit, uh, they do waive fees on their health permit. You just need to have one. And that protects you in case anyone gets sick, things like that. And I would tell you from personal experience, we also collect all of the permits on behalf of our food vendors to have them on file. You want to make sure they're permitted as well. And if you're serving alcohol, you'll need an ABC permit. And that has to be signed off by the city. 
if you're having a nonprofit do the pour, typically I think the fee for that is only $50, where if you're not a nonprofit, the fees can get up into the hundreds. You also have to have alcohol liability on your insurance if your event does include alcohol. For our timeline, um, we have sort of a similar one, but like Alicia said, we have a little bit longer period. Um, ours will close on February 25th. And then we do an internal review with staff, with outside entities, with CSD Fire, with CSD, uh, with our Arts Commission. We have a lot of um, people that, that look over all of these applications. I don't have a, a review criteria slide like Alicia does, but I think you saw that at the beginning and you'll see it when you apply that, you know, the event needs to take place in Elk Grove. It needs to be open to all, whether it's free or you have to purchase a ticket. It can't be like a private event. Um, we like to see how many out of town people that you think you're going to get at your event as one of the council's goals is to drive visitation. So that's kind of nice. We wanna make sure that logistically it works for you. So we'll do all those things and we'll follow up with you if we have questions as well. We, permit, well, we present to the city council on April 27th. They approve the budget and then the funding year begins on July 1st. And that is kind of an overview of the event sponsorship grant program. And some of the questions that you might see on the application that you might need to have a little bit further, you know, instruction or meet to it for us. Thank you. Sorry, I was answering a question and couldn't get back to my slide um, to turn on my video. Okay, so the next is we're going to just go through some grant policies, some basic grant policies that go across um, the, all of our programs. Um, again, agreements for this funding, these funding um, will be July 1st through June 30th, which is the city's um, fiscal year. Um, awarded applicants will receive one or more grant agreements based on the funding source um, and based on um, which applications were awarded um, for the CESG, CDBG, and ARPA. If you're awarded more than one funding source for um, one program activity type, um, so one application, but you applied for multiple funding sources and you're awarded more than um, one funding source, you're going to get more than one grant agreement because the grant agreements are specific to the funding source and the requirements based on that funding source. Um, agreements are sent electronically through DocuSign. We've been doing this process for a few years now, and so it seems to work really well. Um, and we get agreements signed and executed much quicker than the old fashioned way. Um, so that's really great. Um, and we send out an email notification to you in addition to the DocuSign saying, hey, we just sent you this. Um, and it goes to the signing authority. Um, we can copy other staff on it if needed. Um, but you get that and are able to see it. Um, we do encourage in the email, as always, read carefully before signing. Don't just automatically um, click the sign button and get your agreement going through the process because it does happen quickly. Um, they do get signed quickly and go through our process and our system. And we have three different signatures that it gets through. But man, our city attorney's office, our clerk and our city manager, they get through those quickly. So. If you see something that you want an edit or a change or you don't agree with something, do not sign it. Contact staff and let us know um, because after it's executed, so after everybody signs it, it's considered executed and it, most edits require a formal amendment, um, which is more of a tedious process than time consuming. It doesn't take too long, but it is a whole nother process than going through the signature process and creating a formal amendment. So read before signing. Um, insurance for coverage is required of all grantees. The types and amounts will vary based on the activity or the event. They are outlined in the grant agreements um, and we send that to you um, and um, you will get a copy of that that you can then forward on to your insurance agent and make sure that they submit. Um, we have a um, separate, the city uses a um, insurance requirements tracking system, I think it's called ITS is the current vendor um, to manage that process. So um, if you're an existing grantee, your information's already in there. Um, if you're new, you'll get information on how to submit the information to um, ITS. The city will not sign the agreement until insurance requirements are met. So you have to make sure that you submit your documentation prior to us executing your um, agreement. 
file retention um, for CSG, CDBG, and ARPA. All grant-related files must be retained or maintained for five years after the close of the grant period. Um, so making sure that you're documenting that. Um, and for event sponsorships, it's two years after um, the close of the grant period. So making sure that you're aware of what your grant period is on your application or on your agreement. We've mentioned this before. Um, and if you're a returning grantee, um, you're well aware of this, but all uh, grantees must be in good standing with both the California Secretary of State and the California Attorney Registry of Charitable Trusts, um, if required by law to be registered. Um, you must be in good standing at time of application. Um, you must be current and in good standing at time of any payment request. So for programs, if you're requesting quarterly payment requests, we're checking that status um, on both of those prior to um, submitting your or releasing your reimbursement. So just knowing that this gets checked multiple times um, by city staff um, throughout the process, we document it with your application and then we check it again on a regular basis. So um, if you're out of compliance, um, then um, we will notify you that we've noticed you're out of compliance and that you need to get back in, but you really should be keeping an eye on this. Um, a lot of times it's pending um, documentation. That's not the problem. It's just when you become out of compliance, when you're not, um, when you haven't submitted the documentation needing for these. The links are um, on this slide. They're also um, in the web grant system. We've linked them every single place we've mentioned it um, so that it's easy for you to, um, to go. Um, so making sure that throughout the grant terms that you guys are um, up to date on those. Um, communications and city logo. Um, if you, grantees shall include the city's name and logo in all materials identifying any person or entity as being a sponsor. So if you're identifying anyone else as a sponsor, um, then you should be doing similar practices for the city. We do need to approve it prior to you putting the city logo um, and name on it. So if you're doing a flyer or um, some sort of, or if you put it on your website, if you can send us a screenshot or send us a copy of the flyer and say, hey, this is what we do, um, it will go through our um, PR team and they'll look at it and make sure that um, it's something that the city wants to put their logo on and they will tell us the right file size the right they'll send us the right logo because the city does have several different logo types um, and yeah. so they'll look at it based on the other logos you use um, and they will send us or send you the right one and say here use this one um, so we do have all of that sizes. File size. We also have, we have a black logo, a white logo, and a full color logo. So you request what you want from us and uh, we'll send it over. We have high res, JPEG, every version you could possibly want. We ask that you don't stretch the logo. Don't put the logo in a box. <laughs> Just don't manipulate the logo in any way, shape, or form. And um, that's our preference, especially don't put logo in a box, right? Don't put baby in the corner. Don't put our logo in a box, please. <laughs> Um, in instances where the grantee is receiving funding related to the arts, so um, if it's an event relating to the arts, or if it's a program or activity relating to the arts, um, then you also need to display the logo for the Elk Grove Arts Commission. Um, and again, that's something just send us and say, hey, this is what we're going to use logos on, and we will make sure that you have the correct logos um, on that. Um, the grantee permission or the permission for putting logos on. Um, it's generally super quick. Um, I think I've sent a couple, usually my emails are responded to in that day, um, letting me know which logo and um, that I can send to the grantees. So um, it's a quick process, just make sure that you send it to us. Um, payments for any awarded grantees, payments will be submitted in the web grant system. Um, Again, this will be the first year, the July 1 through June 22, July 1, 2022, um, we'll be starting where we're managing our entire grant through um, the web grant system. So if you're a current grantee and you're already receiving funding, all of your stuff is going to stay in the old system. We're going to continue to close those out through Zoom grants um, and through the old system. And it will just be the new programs starting July 1, 2022. Um, that will be processed through web grants. And again, we'll educate you and provide you step-by-step -step instructions how to do all of this, um, but you will be submitting your um, information in there. 
Um, for CSG, CDBG, and ARPRA, we are reimbursement only grants. Um, so you have to have adequate backup documentation that we talked about earlier to be able to request reimbursements for the expenses that you have based on the approved budget in your agreement. Um, event sponsorships, payments may be requested in advance. Do you wanna jump in? Sorry. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, you can request in advance. Uh, it, it used to be 60 days out and with COVID and everything that was happening, we changed it to 30 days out this past grant season, um, just because it, it, we find ourselves in a complicated situation if we give out grant funds and then they're spent and then the event gets canceled. So, but we'll work with you, you know, 30 days prior is fine. Uh, typically, most people are just invoicing us following their event, but Carrie and I both handle payments. And so we're here to work with you on any of that. Um, and all required documentation, whether it's um, reports or event summary forms, permits, anything that is required for your grant agreement has to be submitted and approved prior to payment requests being paid. Um, so knowing that, um, and just as grantees, those of you that are currently funded um, know this, and those of you who um, you know maybe have funded in the future, um, there's usually, especially at the beginning, a lot of back and forth with me um, in terms of making sure we have the correct documentation and it's completely normal um, and it's just what we do and it's our job. Um, so please don't take it personally, um, but we do go back and forth and making sure that we have all of the required documents. And this is for auditing purposes for um, our funding sources, especially um, our federal funding sources. There are some very strict requirements in terms of the documentation that we have. So. Um, Again, we're going to say it again, organizations has to be current and in good standing with Registry of Charitable Trusts and um, Secretary of State. Um, and then failure to comply with terms and conditions of the agreement, um, including but not limited to complying with applicable public health restrictions, um, like Jody mentioned before, may result in the city reducing or terminating funding. So um, making sure that you're well aware of your grant agreement um, and the information that's in there. Um, and this sounds all um, you know, formal and just knowing we as city staff, we're here to help you and to walk through this process and to help guide you through, especially for new grantees, um, understanding their agreements. Um, we typically go through them individually with you. So um, we are here to help make it not so formal and not so um, sounding restrictive. <laughs> um, required reporting, again, these will be submitted in the web grant system. Um, so again, you can have multiple people um, tied to your funding opportunity or application, um, and they can go in and help submit those pieces of those reports. Um, CDBG, CSG, and ARPA, there's either quarterly and or media reports to show persons served. Um, and for CDBG, again, you need to collect information on demographic characteristics and income. Um, and if you have questions about that prior to applying, please reach out to me and I can give you more information. We also ask for annual report from everyone describing the person served and the accomplishments based on the goals and activities outlined in your grant agreement. Um, and then there is financial reporting um, and the type depends on the amount of grant that you received. For the events, we have a, a little less formal um reports that you need to fill out. We do have a post event summary report and that includes a financial summary. So you'll let us know, you know, how much sponsorship dollars you got, uh, what you spent your money on. And then for the post event report, we also have some attendance numbers in there that we asked for. And those are really important for us. We do um, quarterly performance measures that go to the council. None of the events are singled out. They're all lumped together. We have to say how many event days how much money we gave, and then the percentage of out of town visitors and the Elk Grove residents. So I know that's hard always. So it's an approximate number. We don't expect you to be asking every single person that comes to the event, where are you from? But if you happen to have that information, if they pre signed up, if there was a ticket, you know, and you have website, I mean, zip codes, and you're able to determine who's out of town and who's not, that's very helpful. Um, but approximate numbers are just fine. We're just looking for an approximate out of town visitation versus Elk Grove. Of residents served. So technical assistance and monitoring, um, we are available to help grantees throughout the year. Um, we get to know many of our grantees very well, especially those that have been around for a while. Um, most some most have been around before even longer than me. Um, so we provide on-site assistance um, for reporting 
and invoicing. Um, I've definitely, um, now it could be more um, via web or via Zoom. We have the capabilities to join, um, to be able to walk you through reporting and walk you through, especially your first invoicing if you have questions um, or payment requests. Um, if you have any modifications to your scope of work or budget, um, or your event, those are things that you wanna communicate with us and we will um, review and discuss those with you about how those changes can be made or what's approved um, and whether it requires a formal amendment or if it's something that we um, can get administratively approved um, as well as help navigating web grants. Um, again, we're learning the system with you. So we are here to help answer questions um, and guide you through that process. Um, all grants are subject to a financial and program audit by city staff. Um, for CSG, CDBG, and ARPA, we complete, periodically complete monitoring visits, whether that's a desk audit or if we're um, you know, ever coming back out in person, um, where we look at financial and program information. So just know um, you are to maintain your records, um, and we do have the um, ability to come out and um, monitor and audit the program. Whew, so that was a lot. Um, and we're going to go into some questions um, before we do, just in case people decide to jump off, which I encourage you to stick around through the questions. We um, got through that pretty quickly ish um, for the time that we had set aside. Um, we are going to again have the copies of the PowerPoint slides and the recording available on our website um, at elkgrovecity.org uh, forward slash grants. Um, we also afterwards, if you're jumping off, you should get a link to a survey um, that we would like you to respond to. It's a community needs survey and it really gives us guidance on information for um, community programs. So the CDBG um, funding and CSG and ARPA funding of what community needs are. It helps us identify those since you guys are the ones out there um, working with our um, residents and who kind of boots on the ground know what's going on. Um, gives us input in that. So it is um, probably about a 15 minute survey. Um, so um, know it will pop up. You also will likely receive an email. Um, the link is going to be in these um, in this document that we will post. So please, um, over the next couple of days, please take some time to go in and do that um, and answer that. But at this point, we're gonna open it up to some questions. Looks like we've answered everything that was in the Q&A, so you'll need to raise your hand or put another question in there if you have one and we can uh, answer that for you. Yep, if you wanna just type in a question, you're welcome to do that. If you would like to raise your hand and ask, we can unmute you. Or we did such a fabulous job, we answered every question <laughs> possible with this beautiful presentation that Alicia put together. Oh, we have two participants raising hands. Um, all right, let's see if I can figure out how to do this. Okay, so, oh, look, we're getting some questions. Okay, so I am going to, um, Gina, I have allowed you to talk so you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Alicia, I had um, spoken with you um, kind of about this question uh, last week and want to get some clarification on the um, when we need one or two applications. Um, so we're looking at expanding an already um, a, a program that's already ongoing um, along with relocating um, and then also adding to the program. So would that be two separate applications? Um, it depends. I think we need to, um, I do have a note to get back with you. So let's talk um, individually okay. so we can get a little bit more details because if you're just adding to an existing program, it might be the same, but if it, it depends on the services you're providing and- Okay, yes, okay. So it will be different, it will be different. Um, services, I guess. So yes, then we can um, connect separately. That would be great. Okay. Yep. I will mark a note. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Pat Beal, you can unmute yourself. Hi. I just have a quick question about which logo, because we send it out to like 3,000 people on our newsletter. Which logo are you describing when you want us to say we always use that? But you have several, which do you wish us to use? 
<laughs> we have we have two main logos. We have a logo that has a tagline and a logo that doesn't. So it depends on which whatever fits within your publication. And if you're doing color, you can use the full color. If you prefer to do black and white, you can use the black logo. Uh, we're pretty easy going on that as long as it's not a manipulated logo. We have not manipulated anything. We don't do that here. Good for you. Thank you. We appreciate that. <laughs> well, we have the circle. It has City of Elk Grove in California. Oh, that's the that's like a council logo. No, we want to send you this one, the tree logo. Like that's that. why I'm asking you that question. I will send that to you, Pat. I sent you. Perfect. I love it. Tomorrow. We'll put it on the newsletter going out tomorrow. I will send that to you after this meeting. Thank you kindly. You're welcome. Great, great. Thanks for the hard work. Thanks. Okay, Susan Hernandez, you can unmute yourself. Okay, I'm unmuted, but my dogs are talking. <laughs> That's all right. Um, first of all, I, I want to tell you what a wonderful presentation both you and Jody did. It was wonderful, very informative. And uh, so my question is more about the certificates that are required for an event. Like you said, Sacramento County Health. So I have to have that certificate. Um, do I have to have security? I'm serving alcohol. So what level of uh, security do I need? Do you have any idea that you can help me with that? Yeah, so once we see your application and we see, you know, how many in attendance you have, that will determine. So PD usually gets involved once we know there's alcohol being served and they'll say, oh, you know, they've got 50 people. They could do one security guard, but it all depends on. And if you're requesting a facility like District 56 has an additional <laughs> uh, use policy that goes along with it and they have another application you would fill out. And then if you have alcohol being served inside District 56, you have to use their security. They have a security company that they contract with. So it all depends on your event. Once we see your scope and what you're doing, we'll work with you and we'll let you know that like about how many you would need. Like if it's at the plaza, right? And it's a beer focused event, you have to have security at the railroad tracks. You have to have security. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it all depends. Yeah. Well, uh, so do I contact the police department directly or do I do that through you? Yeah, no, once we get your application and if you're approved at that point, then we would know and we would reach out to you and go, okay, hey, based on this event, you know, we either need to meet with PD if, if you're closing roads and doing a huge alcohol okay. event, or if it's something very small, we'll say, okay, here's what you need to do. So we'll guide you through that. Okay. And uh, what about the fire department or having an so, amp? Yeah. And so if it's a large event, um, we are now, um, we just met with CSD Fire last week, actually. So this is good timing. And we are actually going to have one of their chief on our internal reviewing panel for the grants. So they are aware of everything that's happening and they will let us know when it's going to trigger a special event permit. Typically, that's if you have large tents, so bigger than the 10 by 10s. Oh, or if no. you have food vendors that are cooking under tents, that's when yeah. that triggers yeah. them to come out and do a, a, a visit, if you will, a site visit and make sure that your vendors are following um, fire code. But again, once we see your application and we know okay. and we have someone from fire and we have someone from PD on the review, that'll we'll notate, okay, we need to reach out to them and they need to be connected and we'll connect you. All right. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I don't think that would apply to us, but. Oh, good. Great. And also, and I just can't permit. Um, I just have to wait for you to tell me. <laughs> yeah, no, we'll guide you through that. And with a health permit, that's typically if you have a lot of food vendors on site, especially tented vendors. If you had, I think it is under three or less food trucks, but don't quote me, I'd have to look at the health code. You don't actually have to have a permit. It's when you have a large event and you have a large lot of food vendors there, that's when the, the permit is needed. Yeah, we're just uh, doing a catered event. So we're not even involved with that aspect of it. And nothing's cooked. It's all brought in. Uh, yeah. Our Okay, well, exactly. that's good. <laughs> yeah, as we see your application, we'll be able to help yeah. guide you through that. All right, thanks so much. And I really yeah. appreciated the presentation again. Thank you. You're welcome. And Gabrielle, I have, you can unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, I, I just have uh, two, two quick questions, I guess. One, of course, right? <laughs> and all the animals want to talk. <laughs> no worries. Oh, Lord. 
It's part of the Zoom. Give me one second. Sorry. <laughs> I don't think we have any other raised hands. If there's any more questions, feel free to raise your hand or uh, put a type in a question in the chat box, the Q and A. Okay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> it's a zoo around here. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the two questions I had were, um, this would be the first time our organization would be applying for any, any any grants from the city so um i guess are there any limits um you know in in future years from applying from the same types of grants or um you know any restrictions from doing back-to-back -back years or is it just uh, every new year is a new application cycle and, and, and we're eligible every year <laughs> Correct. As long as um whether it's through Alicia's grants or the event grant as long as you know you're um, qualified and eligible, um, then you can apply every year. We've had folks with us for years and years and years think about things like Western Festival or Dickens Fair or things like that. Mm -hmm. that the city has supported every year and has become, you know, part of the Elk Grove fabric, right? So yeah. as long as you're, you're still eligible, we, you know, we ask if you want to apply, apply, and then it has to go through the review committee. Obviously, every year we're getting more and more applications and, mm -hmm. you know, the funding has to be spread out between all those applications. So just be, be considerate when you're asking for things like that, especially on the event side. You saw we only have $80,000 in cash. The bulk of our money is in the in-kind. So just, okay. you know, ask for what you think you need. You might not always get it, um, but we like to support as many as we can as long as they're eligible. One of the things that um, I realized that I uh, did not put in my slides, but I believe it's in the grant application talking about the, um, the um, funding descriptions for the ARPA funds, this is one-time funding. So knowing that if you're applying or receive funding under the ARPA programming, um, it's not something that's gonna be sustainable in terms of your if a program or activity that you're working on. So just knowing that um, and then, um, as Jody said, you know, we have um, pretty competitive programs in terms of a set amount of funds and organizations that um, are interested in it. So um, we do have programs that are funded multiple years, um, but looking at, um, you know, what other funding sources are you attempting to get for these programs, um, just because there's a set amount of funding available um, at one point. So just knowing that, um, but we do have organizations that apply every single year um, for the same program. So. Okay. No, I appreciate it. And then the, the second um, question, I guess, deals with the in-kind stuff. Um, does the Wackford Community Center, um, does that fall under your guys' purview for in-kind um, availability or is that something separate? No, that is through the CSD. Okay. Yeah. Ours is Old Town Plaza and District 56, really, or if you're like wanting to close a road for a run or something like that, the city has the capability to do that. But we do not control uh, the CSD's facilities, which would be Wackford, Laguna Town Hall, the pavilion, things like that. You'd have to reach out to the CSD. Okay, no, I appreciate it. That's all I had, thank you. We do have someone from the CSD on our internal review panel as well. Okay. So if you, you know, in your application, you know, you request a facility and then later in your notes, if you wanted to say something like, if not, you know, we would love to be connected with CSD. There is someone from them on our review panel. Uh, thank you, I appreciate it. Welcome. All right, any other? Questions? Gabriel might have another question. Is oh, I think I just haven't removed his, oh, okay. his, lowered his hand. I'm working on that. All right. Okay. Um, well, we will let you go as a um, reminder. Everything's going to be posted on our website. Um, the, it's a pretty easy forward slash grants landing page for you to get to. Um, as soon as you close Zoom, you should get a pop-up window for um, a community needs survey, and you should also get an email um, either later today or tomorrow um, with the link, but it'll also be on our website. Um, 
I mean, you could please take time to help give us some input on um, what you see as an organization, as a community's needs, or as a resident um, community member. Um, so that is that. And then um, we just want to thank you again for attending. Here is our contact information should you need to reach out to us. Um, thank you so much for your time and for your interest um, and for um, learning this new system with us. We're pretty excited to get through some applications and see how it works. So um, don't forget to register early so that you can have access to that um, and I can improve your account. So thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Good luck. Good job.